first of all, thank you so much for joining us um, today. Um, my name is Karen Sorditich and I am one of the co-conveners of Australia's largest academic, critically engaged sociological association of disabled scholars and people with who are engaging in issues of disability justice. Um, before we begin today, I'd actually like to recognise um, that we are on unceded stolen lands of First Nations peoples um, and pay my respect to elders past and present and recognise those who have joined us today um, to listen to our discussion um, from our speakers who are members of the Critical Disability Studies Group within the Australian Sociological Association. Um, I'd also like to recognise that we're presenting on multiple landscapes, uh, multiple nations. Um, I myself is uh, presenting on the uh, Gadigal people's land um, and our presenters are from uh, are presenting on diverse nations lands across Australia. Um, I do want to give you the heads up that I am single parent homeschooling um, and so every now and again that you will see my screen go blank um, because my daughter will be walking through the room. Oh, you just saw a body in the background. She's gone now. Um, so sorry about that. Um, so we've got quite um, a lineup for what we're going to do, how we're going to present today. We're going to have our four speakers, all of who are members of the Critical Disability Studies Group. Um, and as you can see, we've got um, Auslan interpretation. And also for those of you who like live transcription, we have down the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should see a CC. Um, and it'll have live transcription. So that's available there for you also. So please utilize those functions. Um, this uh, lecture will also be, this discussion will also be recorded and placed on the TARSA Critical Disability Studies um, YouTube site. So, um, you know, feel free to share it or utilize it as part of your teaching, um, however you feel is appropriate. Um, uh, yeah, it'll be fully accessible as well um, for its life, which is great. So um, what I'm going to, how we're going to run it is we're going to have our four speakers um, who are um, Ryan Thornicroft from Western Sydney University, who um, will be talking about his um, topic is what is sociology and why is it important for our futures? Then we'll be going on to the wonderful Raylene West, who is, um, has put a great um, slideshow together for us to talk through her discussion about changing disability models from the medical model to the social model. Then we're going to have the wonderful Judy Singer, um, who's going to talk, uh, her, the title of her talk is a little bit about sociology can go a long way. And um, her innovative work around um, and establishing uh, the category or idea or, uh, I'll let her explain it, um, of neurodiversity. And then we're going to finish with the wonderful Lizzie Knight from Victoria University, who's really going to um, present a little bit on her work around um, disability futures and the role of sociology in shaping that. So first of all, what I'd, who I'd like to introduce is Ryan Thornacroft, um, a wonderful colleague that I have at Western Sydney University. Ryan is a lecturer in criminology in the School of Social Sciences at Western Sydney University. He's interested in the pathologization of non-normative identities and practices, and particularly in relation to crip, crip and queer communities. He has published in a range of leading journals and recently published his first book with Routledge's Interdisciplinary Disability Studies series. So over to you, Ryan. Thank you um, everyone for that and thanks Karen. Um, I'd also like to um, echo um, your welcome to country. I'm um, sitting on Gadigal land. Um, my job today is to provide an introduction to sociology and to highlight why it's important to us and our future. So I'll get started. Um, sociology is all around us and we have all engaged in sociological thinking whether we recognise it or not. 
is because of this seemingly taken for granted status that sociology is somewhat difficult to grasp, understand or pin down. Leonard Broom once said that sociology is a thing which if it didn't exist would have to be invented. Sociological concepts pervade everyday life, class, gender, agency, structure, uh, social status, deviance and more. These are all concepts uh, associated with sociology and sociological thinking. In simple terms, sociology is the study of society. The word sociology comes from the Latin word socius, which means companion, and the Greek suffix logia, which means the study of. According to these root terms, sociology means the study of companionship understood more generally today as the study of human relationships and society. Sociology involves the study of human behaviours and society. It is the study of relations between individuals and society. It explores how people shape society and conversely how society shapes people. Or as Anthony Giddens says, how we create society at the same time as we are created by it. There is a relationship between us as individuals and the society in which we live. And both objects, individual and society, influence and are influenced by each other. Sociology can be understood with a bit more clarity by looking at what it does. Peter Berger tells us that sociology lets us see the general in the particular. It lets us see through everyday encounters and events and to develop broader meanings and understandings. But sociology does not just give us new knowledge or new meanings. It gives us a language to understand things that were previously invisible, but once they become visible, are invaluable to a better understanding of our social world. C.W. Mills developed the idea of a sociological imagination and says that this enables us to grasp history and biography and the relations between the two within society. Sociologists try to find connections between individuals and larger social practices. No matter how private or personal your circumstances, no matter how much you think you have freedom or agency, no matter how much control you think you have of your life, all of our experiences are shaped by broader social forces. Understanding this relationship is central to the work of sociologists. C.W. Mills also said that sociological imagination can be understood through the lens of personal troubles and public issues. He said that many personal troubles cannot be solved merely as troubles, but must be understood in terms of public issues and that public issues must be revealed by relating them to personal troubles. So let's look at the example of unemployment. When someone is unemployed, that is often understood as a personal trouble. Someone's unemployment status might be explained by a lack of motivation, skills, or perhaps even incompetence. Yet if hundreds of thousands of people are unemployed, such as during the global financial crisis or more recently with the global COVID pandemic, it becomes a public issue that requires state intervention. Here we see the link between a personal trouble and a public issue and interrogating what is considered personal in one context and public in another is a keen sociological endeavor. So how do we do sociology and what questions do we ask? Many sociologists have suggested that we are driven by four sensibilities, yet it is also important to recognise that they overlap. Doing sociology means considering historical factors, cultural factors, structural factors and or critical factors. Historical factors consider how past events shape our present and potentially our future. So let's apply this to you. How has your family or perhaps even absence of family shaped who you are? Are there any key life experiences, good, bad, or anything in between or beyond that shape who you are today? Cultural factors consider how traditions, cultural values, and belief systems influence our behaviours and, so and social interactions. It examines how and why cultural change occurs. 
it looks at subcultures like bikers, hipsters, queers, and so on, and examines the ways in which they live their lives. It asks how our own cultural background, the ways we grow up and the things we are taught influence our own identities, beliefs, and ways of being and doing. If we again apply this to you, what role has any cultural identity, belief system, or tradition had in shaping your opinions, beliefs, or, or behaviours? Structural factors consider how social organisations and institutions, whether that be your family, your high school, a university, a workplace, or so on, influence, affect, and shape your lives. It asks how and why these institutions change, how they vary across time and space, and impact and relate to us as individuals and society at large. Critical factors consider and interrogate the status quo. That is, it asks why are things the way they are? Who benefits and who loses if nothing changes? And are different futures possible? These types of questions are critical lines of inquiry for many sociologists. As you will now probably be able to tell, sociology is broad and multifaceted, and in some ways we are already sociologists of some type, as we are often engaged in sociological thinking, whether we recognise it or not. Studying sociology gives you the theories, the insights, and the language to make sense of your social situation, that of others, and society at large. Importantly, it allows us to not simply see things as individual problems. Whether you are unemployed or bullied or incredibly successful, there are factors, some of which are outside of our control, that help explain our circumstances and that of others. Sociology is important for many reasons. For this presentation, it is worth mentioning its importance to diversity work. Zygmunt Bauman and Tim may have written that to think sociolog sociologically can render us more sensitive and tolerant of diversity. It can sharpen our senses and open our eyes to new horizons beyond our immediate experiences in order that we can explore human conditions which have remained relatively invisible. Once we understand better how the apparently natural, inevitable, immutable, eternal aspects of our lives have been brought into being through ex exercise of human power and resources, we shall find it much harder to accept that they are immune and impenetrable to subsequent actions, including our own. Sociology then is about becoming critical thinkers. It is about questioning critically those things that are taken for granted. It is about questioning the things we are often told will not and can never change. So while the rest of this panel will in more detail explore the relationship between sociology and disability, I want to document very briefly what my introduction to sociology taught me about disability. I grew up with a, dis with a sister with disability and that was a source of shame. The bullying and the stigma from others taught me that disability was a bad thing. Michael Oliver tells us that personal tragedy is the grand theory of disability. Disability is often subjected to three responses, amelioration, cure or elimination. And discipline is dominated by medicine and medical explanations and all the pathology and pathologization that comes with that. Yet a sociology of disability taught me something different. I learned that disability is not a bad thing. I learned that the problem is not people with disability, but abled and ableist society. I learned that disability is an identity. I learned that disability can be productive and generative. I learned that another world is possible and that disability can be a source of pride. And this is why sociology is important. It, it avoids individualizing factors that other disciplines may not avoid. We need sociology because it engages in social issues. Without sociology, we, we would fall back into other and different disciplines and their own forms of, of knowledge and particularly medicine, like I just mentioned. And I think I've pretty much run out of time, so I won't say any more than that. Maybe we'll get to it in the Q&A. So thank you for that. Thanks so much, Ryan. That was great. I'd now like to hand over to uh, Raylene West, who will be giving a um, wonderful paper on changing disability models from the medical model to the social model. 
Raylene has lived experience of disability, becoming a quadriplegic as a result of a car accident 20 years ago. She has a PhD in sociology, disability from the University of Melbourne. Her particular research areas are disability and aged care, community-based support services, ableism, social inclusion, and human rights. Dr. West has published papers relating to human rights and health, the NDIS frameworks, individualized funding, workforce conditions, and emerging online Uber-style service markets. So thank you so much for joining us today, Raylene. Um, I'm just going to do a screen share now. So if you can just bear with me, that would be great. Yeah, and just while you're doing that, I'll just introduce myself. So yeah, my name is um, Raylene West and I'm speaking to you today from the Boonarong um, lands of um, the Kula Nation in Victoria. Um, and as Karen mentioned, I um, identify as someone with a disability in the disability community and I utilize a wheelchair um, for mobility. So um, thank you, Ryan, for that fantastic summary um, of what sociology is. That was a great introduction. Um, so Ryan has mentioned that sociology looks at some of the broad trends, elements and patterns that occur in our social world. As sociologists, we spend our time looking at how our social fabric, fabric is constructed, what elements make up a society, who is included and excluded in our society, and then why, and what are the different patterns and influences happening within our society from the past, in the present, and looking into the future. Some examples of these elements could be the influence of technology on society, the role of gender in society, the impact of race, religion, and different cultures within society, conflict, subcultures, and or the role of art, music, and expression in our society. So today I'm going to be talking about one particular element of society, and that is how society views disability, the lens that society gives disability. So in sociology, it's always a good idea to define your topic area first. Let's page down. So disability is defined as a person with bodily difference, either a physical disability or an intellectual disability, or someone with neurodiversity, as Judy will be focusing on next, or someone with a sensory disability, such as hearing or sight impairment. So we understand disability as someone with a bodily difference, whether that be cognitive or physical diversity. But the characteristics that distinguish someone from, quote, normal, unquote, whatever that is defined is these days, because normal is defined as very blurred. You would have heard that catchphrase of what is normal these days. We all have very diff a lot of difference and we're all un unique characters and we all are along the sort of scale of what is normal and we all have differences. So just aware of that. So looking at disability, um, it's a really good case study for sociology. In the last two generations, there has been significant amounts of social change particularly in how people with a disability are viewed and treated by society. People often say that if you want to change the world, study sociology, because it will give you an understanding of how change can be created and what a society might look like. So for people with a disability in Western cultures, so by that we mean Australia, the US, United Kingdom and Canada, Things for people with a disability weren't very good before the 1970s. Society at that time viewed people with a disability as not having any value and of not being able to contribute to society. It was felt that because of their bodily differences, they weren't able to work and be an economic unit. And because of this, they were excluded, stigmatized and shunned by society. They were viewed as dependent and as needing to be looked after. They had no status because people didn't feel they were contributing to the social world. This came about because in the 19th century, society at that time valued above all things bodily perfection. Historically, this was viewed as being the right thing for society at that time, and it was felt that it was needed for the necessary betterment of society. I'll get onto those slides in a minute too, Karen. The increasingly powerful medical profession played a big part in creating the stigmatized image of people with a disability. In their view, all difference needed to be treated, cured and fixed so that all people could have this bodily perfection. 
If this wasn't achieved, people with a disability and their families were told that they needed to be taken out of society and excluded, and that this would be for the social good. So in Western cultures, we begin to see the beginnings of the building of institutions, large buildings acting as a permanent accommodation for people with a disability. These were usually built outside of the township or away from society where people of difference wouldn't be seen and couldn't impact detrimentally on society in any way. So people with a, living, with a disability living in these institutions received no education or opportunities to develop their life skills. So as you can imagine, if you were a person with a disability before the 1970s, things were pretty bad. So we've just got some images so people will have an understanding of what an institution is and um, examining that sort of medicalized control of people with a disability. So you can see on your screen at the moment, here's a, a very big old towering building, uh, one of the institutions that was built in Victoria. Usually these institutions had about a thousand people in them at any one time, sometimes children, but often adults as well. And as I said, they were built on the outskirts of society. I'll just flip the next slide. So very much um, congregate care living with no sort of independence or privacy, um, very much a sort of like factory thing of just getting somebody up, showered, dressed and put into the yard for the day and there was no meaningful life and um, no opportunity for, for people to learn and grow and develop. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so here's just some people with a disability being sort of, you know, put out into the yard for the day just to spend the day. Um, you can see they're pretty bored, uh, haven't got much activity to do and yeah, not really leading any meaningful life. They're just sort of plonked there really to exist. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so the medicalized control, as I said, up until the 1970s, things weren't good for people with a disability, but institutionalization continued um, even past that. So right up until 2015 in Victoria, we still had institutions where people with a disability were living away from the community. So this is one of the last institutions that closed in 2015 up in Sandhurst. And I'll just go to the next page. So you sort of think that, and here's a gentleman that sort of lived a lot of his life in an institution. Um, obviously, they've been modernised since those big old buildings, but people were still basically living in congregate care, um, excluded from society. Um, so it isn't, isn't a thing from the distant past. There's you know, people in our generation and people we know now that have a, um, a lived history of living in an institution. Let's go to the next page. Um, again, here's somebody in a segregated work situation, um, again, away from the normal working employment roles. And I'll just flip on to the next one. And I've just put this slide in. This is a bit of a, some cutting edge disability sociology at the moment, but it um, might help you sort of to understand in terms of sociology and disability and exclusion, the medical control of people with a disability is still occurring right up until this day. So this debate happening in the disability community at the moment is about um, the screening of unborn babies um, for disability and then their termination if they're deemed as having a disability. So it is the medical profession um, is highly controlling whether babies are actually born with a disability. And if they have a disability, they're usually suggested that, it, that the, um, the pregnancy is terminated. So um, it's very much impacting on what the next generation um, in our society will be and how much diversity will exist in our next generation. Um, and it's a very controversial area at the moment in the disability studies community. Um, and there's a lot of tension between the medical profession and the disability community in this area in terms of the medical control um, occurring in this area. So I'll just go to the next slide. Okay, so I'll just hold it there for a while and I'll catch up on where I am with my notes. All right, so just um, so just finishing off on the medical model and so you have a good understanding of medical model. If you were born with a disability or bodily difference at that time, it was usually advised by a medical doctor that the child be taken away and put into an, into an institution and that the family get on with having other children in the family. Um, 
if people have um, studied Indigenous studies, you may have heard of a thing called the Stolen Generation, where children were taken away from their families and placed in an institution. Um, this is a very similar thing that occurred to people with disabilities. So it's a parallel um, element of society that was occurring. And, you, and we have to remember that at this time, society thought it was doing the right thing. It actually thought it was best for the child and best for society as a whole. Um, and it was condoned and supported by the medical profession. Um, so by the 1970s, thankfully, things started to change. Um, by the 1970s, you started to get a lot of other social change occurring, such as second wave women's rights, racial equality movements. People started questioning why people with a disability were being treated so badly, why they were being excluded from society, why people with a disability themselves that had managed to forge an education started to question the oppression that they were receiving from the medical profession and questioned why the medical profession had so much control over their lives to the point where they were able to exclude them into an institution. Then to further this, these scholars expanded this and said that it wasn't just the medical profession creating barriers to our exclusion, it was all of society. It was the physical and attitudinal barriers from all of society which were preventing the inclusion of people with a disability. So their argument was it wasn't their bodily difference that was causing the exclusion but the attitude of society towards them causing exclusion. So this was a pivotal moment in the disability studies and in sociology. In looking at society, they had turned the lens upside down in examining how exclusion was occurring and how change needed to occur for inclusion to be achieved. This became known as the social model. Mainstream people were supported and educated to see the physical and attitudinal barriers they were creating and contributing to, which was perpetuating the exclusion of people with a disability from society. So an attitudinal barrier may have been an employer realizing that he was being discriminatory in not employing someone with a disability just because of their bodily difference, or a shopkeeper or a restaurant owner not wanting someone with a wheelchair in their shop and suddenly realizing that this was being inequitable and discriminatory towards a person with a disability. And yet, even though this radical shift in thinking and revolution in terms of how society viewed people with a disability hit the mainstream discourse in around the 1980s, we still have quite a lag in terms of trying to overcome a lot of these physical and attitudinal barriers that still exist in society. So we have some photos now of some physical barriers that still exist around society, which create exclusion for people with a disability. So here we have a shop front um, with a step out the front, as you can see. So that makes it exclusionary towards anyone who uses a wheelchair to get into a building. Um, and countries overseas like America, um, if you don't have level entry into a shop, the shopkeeper um, can be sued because they, it is viewed that they have a discriminatory element towards um, their shop and their trading. But we don't have these laws in Australia at the moment and the regulation isn't really strong enough. So these barriers continue to exist and we're in 2021 at the moment. And just go on to the next slide. Um, our public transport system still needs a, a little bit of work. Like it's, it's getting there. We have the new low Ford trams in in Melbourne and some platform stops, um, but still probably four or five of every tram that goes down the line is one of these older trams with the steps. So that makes it exclusionary towards people with a disability or a lot of other people, just general mobility impairments. Into the next slide. Um, here's a, a lecture theater at a university with a, a wheelchair spot down the bottom, which is, is good, because at least you're gonna get into the lecture theater and attend the lecture theater, but I guess, you know, you can't sit up the back with your mates as you normally would in a, in a lecture and, and um, you have a defined seating place, whereas nobody else in the lecture theatre has to sit in a defined area. So um, improvements are happening, but there is sort of still subtle exclusions in the built environment. Um, and here's some people, you know, beginning to challenge, challenge things, saying, you know, we're not happy with the, the transport system and we're not happy with the built environment and we're... 
um, had enough of this exclusion and that, you know, mainstream um, society needs to get on board with things. So just thought I'd um, say that a lot of these changes are based on um, advocacy and activism. Yep. Okay, so just get back to my notes. So I said, things are gradually improving, but it has taken society two generations since the 1970s to really think about how it views people with a disability, what has caused this exclusion, think of mechanisms to create and implement social change to fix things, to be able to ensure people with a disability are included in society, and that society sees their value of inclusion and the value that diversity and difference can bring to society. You may on TV have recently seen the Paralympic Games, and there's been a lot of initiatives and such as International Days of People with a Disability and inclusion in media presentations, trying to explain um, the need for inclusion of disability and diversity. So we have some photos now of um, people with a disability breaking the glass ceiling um, and creating a bit of empowerment. Um, so this one's great because this is people with a disability shaking up the fashion industry a lot. And as you know, the fashion industry is, you know, highly focused on bodily perfection and, and a certain shape and a certain look. So um, it's great to see that people with disability are in there sort of shaking that up a bit and sort of um, bringing to the fore that um, beauty can be achieved through, you know, diversity. Let's go to the next one. Um, so, yep, we just had the Paralympic Games and we've seen some amazing athletes doing some amazing things over in Tokyo over the last couple of weeks. Um, and it is a great um, way of getting across to mainstream society of just the, like the value of people with a disability and, and that they're making their own contribution in their own way and are, and are working hard and contributing to society. Yep. And I just mentioned earlier, so the media are doing a, a great role in the last few years of... Um, really integrating people with a disability onto media platforms, um, you know, TV and media platforms. Um, there's a lot of shows these days questioning things on disability and educating the mainstream about disability. And we're starting to see, you know, even news readers just in a wheelchair, um, regularly just doing out a journalist job. Um, it isn't anything unique or unusual or anything inspirational. It's just someone with a disability undertaking a normal employment role. Okay, and if you get some time, um, I recommend that you see, uh, there's a TED talk by an advocate that we all knew, Stella Young, um, talking about the, you know, that people with a disability aren't there for inspiration. They're just um, getting on with their lives and living their normal life and wanting to be included um, like any other person. And it shouldn't be something exceptional or unique, this inclusion of people with a disability. So if you get some time, I sort of encourage you to um, have a look at that TED talk. And if you want to see some of the, Ad advocacy work and activism that people with disability have been doing. Um, there's a film called Defiant Lives. If you can get your hands on that, that's a, a good one to watch. So in concluding, um, I hope you've um, sort of got something from this little glimpse into disability studies world and it has shown you the power that sociology can have, that it can create large social change and radical and powerful social change by looking at the details of how our society and how people within our society are viewed and the differing elements and mechanisms that drive inclusion and exclusion in our society. So thank you for taking the time to listen today and engaging in some discussion on disability studies. And yep, if you want to change the world, go and study sociology. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much, Ray. That was fantastic. I'd now like to hand over to Judy Singer. Um, who's going to give us a, a discussion on a little bit of sociology can go a long way. Judy Singer is recognised for coining the term neurodiversity in her 1998 sociology disability studies thesis, um, honours thesis at UTS. She identified as being the middle of three generations of women somewhere on the autism spectrum. She proposed the concept as an addition to the categories of intersectionality and as a possible umbrella term for an emergent new social movement based on neurological diversity. She now identifies as an elder of the neurodiversity movement and promotes the concept locally and internationally while retaining a critical perspective on its developments. She does have a blog spot that you can follow up as well after this seminar. 
Over to you, Judy. Land of the Gadigal people. And um, I want to begin by just thanking the previous people who spoke, Raylene and Ryan, for really um, uh, explaining um, what sociology is and what it what it's useful for, as well as um, explaining um, uh, what the, the difference between the social model and the um, um, medical model. So I'm um, I'm going to. It's probably going to take me a while to warm up, um, but. Um, uh, it saves me having to take up time with all with all that, and I'll just going to go on to giving you um, a more personal ex example of how basic grounding in sociology is important for anyone who's interested in working in the disability field. I'm going to tell you about how a bachelor's degree with it sociology major took me to places that I could never have dreamed of and um, perhaps I did dream of it a little bit but the fact that it's happened is, is quite amazing. So I'm going to divide this into three parts, something about my work um, and neurodiversity, something about my personal background and how it, it shaped the ideas and also finally why sociology is important um, from the point of view of uh, the neurodiversity. Um, so I'm going to start with um, my uh, background to neurodiversity because I'm not sure how whether people here know what it is or not. Um, so I am going to um, explain what I think it is and um, or should be. And um, here goes. Um, so it began in 1998. I wrote an honours thesis at UTS called, it's a lengthy title, I'll have to actually read it. Um, and it's basically subtitled, A Personal Exploration of a New Social Movement Based on Neurological Diversity, which I then foreshortened to neurodiversity. Um, I had, I had a, I, I came to disability studies while I was still at Macquarie Uni um, and I happened on a course on uh, um, disability in society um, taught by Professor Lynn Davis and it absolutely blew my mind. It began to explain what had happened to, to my family. Um, I was beginning to understand that our outsiderhood and our failure to be successful in, in life had a lot to do with a disability that no one had even named yet. And I myself didn't know what its name was. It took me many years before I did actually um, find out. Um, but it was enough for me to keep, I was still searching for who my people were. And um, I decided that I wanted to do um, honours and, I'd heard about uh, Professor Andrew Yakubovich and Helen Mikosha, who were leaders of the Australian Academic um, Disability Studies. And I managed to persuade Andrew Yakubovich to take me on and, as my, and be my supervisor. And that was the most wonderful period of my life because I was able to join a disability studies network and, um, and broaden my knowledge and have amazing insights and conversations. So that's where it began. Um, I'm just now going to talk about what is neurodiversity. Hang on one sec, because I dropped my mouse and I'm reading from the screen. Um, it would help if I knew how to do this. Um, so what is neurodiversity? Uh, unfortunately, we kind of agreed that some of us wouldn't use um, um, diagrams which might have been um, sorry screen sharing which might have been helpful so basically what does it mean it refers to the infinite diversity of human minds on the planet it is um, a subset of biodiversity 
And my idea was that just as the more, it was it generally recognised that the more diverse an ecosystem is, biodiverse, the more sustainable and flourishing it is. And I wanted to apply the same paradigm to the value of human diversity for a sustainable and, and flourishing culture or human society. Um, so um, for me, um, the thing about neurodiversity, by the way, is that the meaning has evolved and not, and not necessarily in ways that I'm happy with, but I'll talk about that later in the critical section. But for me, neurodiversity is a state of nature to be respected. It's an analytical tool for examining social issues and an argument for the conservation and facilitation of human diversity. And I feel very strongly that it should not be used as a synonym for neurological disorder, which unfortunately it has been taken over and by corporate and medical interests as a kind of easy shortcut. Um, and I'll be talking about that later. So if you're interested, what I did not define neurodiversity. Um, I kind of I thought it was self-evident. I've simply, I've since discovered that it's incredibly, you can go, you can dig very deep into what it really means. But this is all that I actually said about it in my thesis. I'm going to read it out to you. Um, so I said, my thesis was basically, I should say it was based on participant observation um, of um, online autistic self-advocacy communities who are actually driving this movement and who are actually the ones who were educating the medical profession that is now, um, in my opinion, seeking to reclaim the space for themselves. And I have no objection to that, by the way, in terms of, you know, I'll probably say more about this later, but it seems important to me that even though I was um, immersed in the social model of disability and felt that I stood on the shoulders of giants, I've never been a fundamentalist. And I actually said right then in 1998 that I believed that the uh, that ideally it's the um, it's got to be a um, there's got to be a balance between social constructionist and um, and scientific medicalized views. And that is part of a dialectic that is or a, a process of change that we constantly have to work towards. Um, anyway, so this is what I wrote. Um, for me, the significance of the, aut the autistic spectrum lies in its call for and anticipation of a, of a politics of neurodiversity. The neurologically different rep represent a new addition to the familiar political categories of class, gender, race, etc., and will augment the insights of the social model of disability. And the rise of neurodiversity takes postmodern fragmentation one step further. Just as the postmodern era sees every once too solid belief melt into air, even our most taken for granted assumptions that we more or less see, feel, touch, hear, hear, smell and sort information in more or less the same way, uh, unless we're visibly disabled, are being dissolved. So what I'm saying is that I did not, all I, I the, my idea was implicit for two reasons. It was one, to add uh, neurodiversity to the categories of disability politics. At that time in 1998, it's, it's hard to believe, but the, whole, the disability paradigm was only about um, physical disability, intellectual disability, and mental illness, the grab bag of, of everything that was left over. Um, and if it, uh, people like us in the, on the autistic spectrum were, would, if they fitted anywhere, I mean, because of the spectrum, obviously some are intellectually disabled, some not, but they would have fitted into a mental illness and been misdiagnosed. You know, um, in my own family, I was always terrified of being diagnosed as schizophrenic. 
I was I was worried about my mother if she was ever institutionalized. She had she was also so it was pretty it was a difficult time. And suddenly we knew that none of these categories suited us and that we were, well, we were a new category of disability. Um, so where I got the idea is that remembering this is the 1990s, I was conjoining the three trends emerging from the postmodern era, the um, success of identity politics movements. I hope to put uh, neurodiversity in a lot. The, I expected that the neurodiversity movement would be the greatest, the latest, not the greatest, um, uh, identity politics movement to emerge from the post-modernist era. Um, it was also based on uh, changing times. Um, it was the ascendance of hard neuroscience, hard neuroscience over psychodynamics or the soft, I wouldn't even call it the science of psychodynamics. Um, people were disillusioned with um, spending decades on the couch, you know, and not changing, spending fortunes, particularly autistic people, people like myself, I'd been in therapy for decades by that stage. I was in my forties by the way, when I did this. Um, and it was all about, you know, what did my parents do to me that made me like this and um, never found an answer. So this was, um, just a mind-blowing realisation as I started to talk to um, other people on, in the autistic self-advocacy movement. Why? One of my things was, why do I find it so hard to make eye contact? What, did you, what is it about my parents? What, how did they turn me out this way? Well, we realised that we're, it's a very common characteristic of the spectrum. The other thing was, of course, the rise of the, of the green movement. Um, as, be, as being central to our future. And so in a way I was just putting, I just whacked neuro, at, you know, which was kind of like the new priesthood of what we believed was human nature with um, diversity, which came from the green and also the civil rights, black civil rights movement. Um, and it's gone the way of all political movements. Um, it has naturally polarized um, I might talk about that a little bit later. There are, you know, the usual factions and infighting that happens. Um, for, I, it's an example, I suppose, of the dialectics of change. And when I, at university, when I heard the word dialectics, I used to just about, <laughs> I just used to freeze up because it was too terrifying. But it just means that the idea that you come up with a thesis or an idea and, um, and it and it, it spreads, and then of course it it engenders an an opposition antithesis, and over time these two form a new synthesis, and that is what's happening at the moment. I'm not sure that I like this, where it's going, but again, more about that later. So I just want to um, say that from my point of view. Um, the greatest achievement of the neurodiversity movement was seeing people with labelled, medically labelled neurological conditions, not solely under the microscope of what is wrong with them, but as people with strengths and weaknesses, just like everyone else, people who have unique contributions and needs, which like positive and negative ions, hold society together. Some of us have needs, others um, are good at love to supply needs. So, you know, we're all in this together. Um, so my thesis was really about, I tried to pack an enormous amount into it. Um, part of it was um, my curiosity. Why did, why did this idea of the autism spectrum emerge at this particular time in history? And, um, and for me, my answers were um, decline in the authority of the medical model, particularly, and people will write about this sometimes, I never seem to mention this, it was the rise of women's empowerment through the women's movement. 
Like we had been blamed for all that happened to our children and particularly autistic parents, you know, we, we were, they were supposed to be caused by autistic refrigerator mothers. And we had the strength to say, bloody hell, no, we're not, um, we're not, we didn't create this. This is an organic condition an inherent condition. Um, this was difficult at that time because my generation, um, we were wedded to the idea that um, it, it's a nature to nurture pendulum, that people, that we were against essentialism, you know, that there was no essence. And basically, I did not agree with that. And actually, that pendulum has now swung away from thinking people are totally uh, created by society and by their parents. Um, the pendulum has now, to my mind, become a bit more balanced. Um, I think, that, I mean, there are downsides to, um, to that, that view in, in that, which particularly affected a woman. If there's something's wrong with the individual, someone must be blamed. And actually, you know, we have to have a balanced view of what is genetic, what is inherited and what is created by society. And every and that is a, it's kind of a life's work um, to figure that one out. I often think about the um, the serenity prayer that says, um, "Grant me the the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, which is my body, my genes, to change the courage to change the things that I can." and which is society, and finally, um, to have the wisdom to know the difference, not waste energy, I guess. Um, and that, but that is, again, I think is a life's work. Um, and that's uh, what happened to the rest of my, here it is. Excuse me. I've also just switched to Apple from Microsoft, from the hell of Microsoft, and now I've got the hell of Apple, and I just lost everything. Hang on. I think you can still see me. Uh, there I am, not. We there can see you. Yeah. And where? what happened to my notes? Um, sorry. Here they are. Oh, yes. Judy, just two minutes more. Really? And yeah. I haven't even, oh, my God. I finally, I, I was going to set my thing. Oh, all right, then I'm just going to. All right, I'm going to rush off to to how I won't bother about that. So, so why sociology is important? Rebellion against the psychomedical model. You can't simply can't treat disability without social context. Psychology aims to fit problematized people into society as it is, square pegs. Sociology examines how personal problems are the tip of icebergs of social issues you need to look at it through the lens of intersectionality all the way you know the usual ones indigeneity diasporized people um, refugees I was one my family were refugees physical appearance of course is very important people don't like to talk about that um, so and I'm not a great follower of this movement and I intend to continue to take a critical stance so I've already outlined the positive side of it um, I I understand that movements evolve. Um, I'm not necessarily happy with the direction and I'm definitely keep putting my oar in to keep it in the way that I would like to see it go. It, is a, it was a grassroots movement. The medical model is once again, trying to subsume it. We've heard, I've got one university who, who wants to set up an international society for neurodiversity. Um, no, I, which I really oppose because it's a, they're all doctors and lawyers, and I'm I'm actually on on the don't tell them, but I'm going to I'm on the advisory committee for that, and I'm telling them to can it. Um, none of the people who found it were professional. Blah blah blah. blah. Um, well, I fear we'll be shut out, and those who mind us for our lived experience will jargonize us and and it's disempower us. Um, current controversies. Um, we've got now another uh, very controversial project called, I think, Simon Baron Cohen, who's unpopular in the disability movement. I, I like him, but I think he can be very blinkered. And he's got this new, basically, he's 
called Autism 10,000, in which they're going to look at, in which they're going to get 10,000 autistic people and do a long-term like, genetic um, uh, study of what it is. For me, it's it's kind of interesting, but it's I need, I've only just found out about it and there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of conflict. So, it's, you know, I'm interested in whether autism is still a thing or, or just a conglomeration of things. Um, I think it isn't a thing anymore. I think we need to switch to a needs-based versus label-based, medical label-based system. Um, using uh, other neuro, neuroscience as calling neurodiversity a synonym for neurological difference is just the latest form of othering. And once again, we're going to be hived off into the, the non-neurodiverse and neuro, I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, uh, let's see, final bit. Oh, come on. Where did that go? So I want to talk about, and I'm read, there's a whole, the whole thing is now turning to neurodiversity in the workplace. I have gave a talk about this to Stanford University and Medical School had a neurodiversity conference. It was all about neurodiversity in the workplace. I talked about the commodification of neurodiversity, the selling of the idea that efficiency and productivity are the main goals of human life and that neurodiverse people make a docile, grateful, obedient workforce. I personally relish being an oppositionalist. What's the word? defiant opposition anyway whatever it is um uh it seems to be turning into an international trade in male computer programmers corporations are taking it on you know all the major corporations are, are now have neurodiversity policies uh my contacts in the corporate world are well-meaning enthusiastic sincere and devoted but we must be vigilant that it doesn't become a box ticking virtually virtue signaling exercise um, so there is a big role for sociologists to, to evaluate what is actually happening in this field to keep things on track. My goal, I'll just end on this note, my goal in this work was never to make capitalism more efficient, but to make it more humane. I will leave that with you as a guide. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Judy. And I'm sorry we ran out of time. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was going to time myself and I forgot to press the button. <laughs> no problem at all. Oh, I've actually been forgetting to keep track myself. Um, I'd like to hand over now to Lizzie Knight from Victoria University, um, who is an educational sociologist and professional careers counsellor and works as a research fellow at the Centre for International Research on Educational Systems at the Dual Sector Institution in Victoria University. Uh, Lizzie has lifelong experience of connective tissue issues and worked against disability discrimination in post-school settings for the last 20 years. And Lizzie will be presenting on you and disability futures and the role of sociology. So over to you, Lizzie. Thanks so much and thanks for this opportunity, Karen. I've just so enjoyed um, hearing everyone's talks. I just wanted to start by acknowledging that I'm um, coming to you from the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, and I just thought I'd tell you um, what I'm going to talk about today um, and, um, and sort of almost hope and attempt to, to draw together colleagues on the panels um, uh, sort of thoughts and think about um, try and leave us with some idea of what we can do next and where we can take this and um, the power of sociology and social sciences. Um, I think um, I wanted to start, you know, as a critical disabilities scholar, as also as locating myself in um, in the work and where where I come. I consider myself a disabled person, disabled woman, um, and um, I uh, also consider myself a sociology oriented career counsellor. That um, is a slightly unusual kind of positioning, in that many uh, and much of career development and career counselling has been psychologically oriented. Um, and some of the history of career development 
has come from a psycho psychological background. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our conceptions of careers as a case study and also um, how disability can be a lens in which we can um, sort of see and see the world differently. And I just, you know, couldn't start without saying that I really enjoyed um, the talks and how we can see in um, these people's practice who've been on the panel, we can see in Judy's work, um, thinking about the world differently and enabling us to, to view um, neurodiversity as um, a, a distinct concept and bringing that to disability studies so importantly. And I think also Ray's um, talk and that those images, which are so important of the institutions that we have to think that we are both sociology helps us to think about our history, think about our culture and think about our practice um, with different long term lenses. Um, and Ryan's talk, I am going to draw on later um, and hopefully not absolutely plagiarise, which is um, uh, so. Um, but I just thought that was really interesting about thinking about how we think about our own practice and our work. So talking about my own practice um, the idea of career development and how we think about how we choose professions our jobs our roles um, career development sociology says that we think about ourselves, which is important we have to know about the world of work and about how that is in a sociology oriented um, career development also helps us think about um, us more than personal troubles about where we are in the workplace, but also about how workplaces operate, how work um, uh, is subject to forces um, and, and different kind of things that perhaps aren't always made transparent and how is a, um, uh, we can use sociological lens to make um, those more, more sort of obvious. One of the things I've been working on is thinking about um, how uh, people with disabilities and disabled people are um, in the workforce and how they have different experiences and different trajectories and how sort of structural inequalities can be um, uh, can be add to that and Ray's talk sort of, sort of brought in some of the clear historical issues that have formed our ideas and understanding about work about disabled people um, and I think that there's a really interesting work um, Catherine Berheide talked about about um, glass ceiling that Ray mentioned but also about sticky floors the expectations drag us and hold just to the ground sometimes. Um, we know from um, uh, my research that both the people um, with disabilities are um, quite often found in um, lower um, levels of um, vocational education. They're often found in less um, uh, profitable or less um, uh, high status, higher education institutions. Although we do know, and one of the wonderful things about sociology and higher education is we know that there is a conceit that um, uh, it's easier sometimes to make reasonable adjustments to higher education. So I'm going to make sure that today we talk a little bit about sociology, but also the broader social sciences and where social sciences also informs practice, not just in higher education, um, but also can inform all social practice. So I'm, I'm drawing on a very basic kind of um, uh, idea of sociology and sort of drawing on the British Sociological Association's idea of thinking about it as um, reasoning and critically analysing the working society and how that can um, really inform all our practice throughout um, our work. We know that um, when you think of a sociology degree, the most common things that people research tells us say with things like sociology professor and as many of us on the panel are sociology academics that may be obvious but we want to sort of break that apart and think about sociology in the world and that's really my um uh my big interest here there's of course um social science teachers which is a hugely important but thinking of unique jobs like sociology and counseling both personal counselling and also career counselling, the importance of sociology is informing social work in practice, um, sociologists in practice in both government and not-for-profit works. Um, thinking also non-traditionally about the lawyer and how it can be informed by sociology, sociology the cultural reporter, 
educational administrator making those decisions about inclusion um stretching uh, sort of the ideas of sociology a bit further let's also think about the importance of sociology in lots of personal work substance abuse counselor family um family counselor and the importance of taking this sociological lens all across um uh, across workplaces i'm going to put in the chat at the end of my talk a resource that you might like that um which is the um my future bullseyes and we could sociology deconstruct how comfortable we are with the idea of a bullseye but it is useful that it looks at different levels of um, education different jobs and thinking about how you can embed so social science can be and um, whatever level of qualifications you are thinking of a prisons officer is just as important to have um, some uh, thinking about sociology and so I think we need to you know free sociology a bit from the academy as well but it it can be you you can read and access sociological texts of all levels and you don't have to have a sociology sociology degree um, to to practice and think about um, thinking sociological ways um, and so I think that um, I think thinking back about uh, critical disability studies just before I finish, I think that I, I think that we don't want to say that it has to be only disabled people or people with lived experience of disability thinking about critical um, disability studies lens, but also it can be a really important way of us seeing um, environment and how society functions of thinking as an othered um, person. I, I sort of use a person example, one of my problems is sort of I've got all these joint problems and things, and I can't stand at events and at networking. And for me, it's a visceral kind of thing is I sit down when people are networking and it's a disadvantage in a way, but it's also an advantage that I can see so much more more and see who's anxious and see who's interested and where people are moving. So thinking about us in the room and thinking sociologically in that way, I think is really good. I was going to finish with um, this quote from May and Bridger, who were thinking about making a shift of the magnitude that we wish in terms of social justice requires cultural and systemic change at both policy and practice levels. And I just um, uh, hope that sociology can can work both in practice and, and I hope sociology stays you know strong in the academy and we have students and researchers all through but also through practice um, and I just want to draw on what um, Ryan was saying in the thing that um, and uh, that sociology can be throughout everything and can provide us a lens um, and thanks very much I'm going to finish there short and sweet fantastic thank you so much um, Lizzie, and thank you all to our panellists. I'd now like to actually open to question time. I wonder if we can, Sally, if you wouldn't mind pinning all of our panellists. Uh, that's a really wonderful comment, Claire. Thank you so much. Um, Ricky, Ricky Spencer. Hello, Ricky. Um, how can we embed these ideas in special school settings? Oh, contentious question. Now, who would like to take that question? Lizzie, Ryan, Ray, Judy, who would like to take that question? How can we embed these ideas in special school settings? Ray? Um, well, I think it's very much about um, educating the workforce and educating the people in those settings to, um, you know, ensure that they have inclusive practices and they are aware of how um, barriers are operationalised um, at the varying different levels from, you know, the physical to the attitudinal. Um, so they very much need to be aware of them themselves so they don't perpetuate them and they don't create things and environments of things like control and um and exclusion in the in the educational setting. So I very much think workforce training and professional development, um, in particular these areas, and sort of um, in promoting sort of understanding of things like the social model and inclusion and understanding of neurodiversity and diverse ways of um, that people work and study. Yep. Fantastic. Someone else. Who else would like to respond to Ricky's question? Lizzie, Ryan, Judy. Um, no, well, maybe I could say, oh, if I'm yeah, on. go for it, Judy. Oh, you can hear me. Yeah. Well, maybe I could say that, you know, 
some these ideas are kind of out there already and um i i think well i don't know i mean from what i can see they've actually come a long way these ideas of inclusion intersectionality in the education system I, is that not right I mean, Rome wasn't built in a day, but no, I think that's uh, it is that it is getting better, Judy. I hope I'm allowed to speak. <laughs> I think I I, I'm, I'm just with my own experience in teaching in, in, in school settings. I still feel as though there is gaps in terms of uh, teachers uh, being able to link more with community spaces and bring in employers. Um, and, and build that sort of connection, that that and that deeper connection to have our our young uh, young emerging adults with um, disabilities uh, to look for their strengths and provide them access into the world, uh, into the open employment market. Um, as there's some teachers still within um, the settings I've worked for that aren't comfortable with that. It's almost as, and, and I've been speaking to quite a few young people who've left the setting that feel that they've somehow feel as though they weren't allowed to, um, to express their own sense of creativity and explore um, like a student in a mainstream school can explore different ways of doing things or being it's still very kind of um oh, what's a cotton balled approach that oh you know we don't you know we don't think this person can do this or you know we're looking at i don't know for me the passion is i, I want to really disrupt that sense of um ableism that's still kind of embedded in school structures i hope that makes sense but you know my passion is to really that's one to me the one of the last bastions if we can get through to to special school settings to really encourage students and teach especially more importantly teachers that let's look for our partnerships in in community and let's give uh students that potential for real work and something i think that uh i uh, can't remember now because i have memory issues i think it was lizzie or, or or someone i met who had a daughter with a number of disabilities creating art to take those sort of models and really push it out there that yeah that's great so um we've we've got quite a number of questions um and we've only got uh, 12 minutes and we do also need to um, get on to the uh, what's it called competition um, Judy we actually have um, a question specifically targeted at you um, and that was um, how do you think neurodiversity has grown and changed since you um, um, okay. discussed the term then we've got a couple for Lizzie and then a couple for the panel overall um, so maybe if we could just all spend a maximum of, say, one minute to 90 seconds in responding to these questions. Okay, so very quickly, um, it, well, it's huge in, in the UK, it's just, and it's huge in the corporate world, um, in America as well, like all the major companies have now got neurodiversity policies, um, it's, it's talked about in government, it's, um, um, also in Europe, there's a lots of companies, corporations in Europe who are taking it over, not taking it over, who are developing policies. So in Australia, well, you know, Australia, it's kind of, it has to happen overseas before it really happens here. I think, you know, unless you're a swimmer with big feet or something, but anyway. Um, so yeah, it's going. And then of course, there's, a, there's that dialectic process that I was talking about in which People are polarised. There are people who, who love it. It's changed their lives. There are people who loathe it. Um, it's, um, it doesn't take um, into account the seriousness of, uh, of you know, some forms of autism and that all, all of that. I, I, again, I like to hold the middle ground with all of these things. So I think that's enough for now. That's great. Fantastic. Thank you. Lizzie, question for you. Um, Rick. Uh, this is from Justine. She really loved your talk and she wanted to 
actually uh, get your opinion on how you saw the possibility of making these spaces more equitable, especially given, you know, that um, networking and meeting other students and so forth in these kind of environments are really important for one's career. Over to you, Lizzie. Thanks, Karen. I've, um, I've replied and put a link in the chat because I saw Justine's comment about a website I really love about conference accessibility, thinking about higher education networking and physical versus virtual presences. I mean, for me, the uh, I mean, I can probably speak to this. I'm, I'm aware this is being recorded, so I won't say that I'm surprised and delighted that all the times I asked for conferences to be virtual over my thing, it's become possible now because of COVID, which is fantastic. But um, all the times things couldn't be made any other the way. Um, it's been a lovely surprise taking a very positive uh, view of how, how accessible it can be and I hope we don't go back when we go back after the pandemic. Um, do you want me to answer the other question which is about... Yeah, do you, uh, are you with, this is the... Government one? Yeah, that'd be great, Lizzie. So uh, just quickly, so it was about um, policy makers in government, whether they have a good understanding of sociological concepts. I'm not sure. I'd like to think so. Um, actually, it's interesting. Some of the graduate programs um, for civil servants um, in Australia and Victoria and the federal government do have kind of an idea of sociology. My um, one hope is that we can start, like Ryan was saying, start think about these things as oppositioned, well start thinking about medical models as not just truth, you know, I'm not debating medical evidence, but psychology is not the only way to see things. And I think in career development, that's a battle that hasn't even been started. Um, uh, and I think that in social policy, including ideas of sociology is massively important. And thank you for your question. That's great. I actually want to open now to Ryan and Raylene, because I think, I think um, they'll have a lot to say about this. And that is... Um, what are your thoughts on how chronic ongoing illness fits into the social model of disability? And I particularly have a bias in this because of the way that uh, chronic illness is often actively used as a way to exclude certain cohorts within social policy, disability social policy. So I think it's a really important question, um, particularly as social policy tightens up around categorizations of disability. So I'd like to actually hand that over to Ray first and then over to Ryan. Um, well, yeah, like um, most uh, models, the social model has its critiques. And one of the critiques is it doesn't take into account um, bodily um, impairment, like the bodily difference, bodily um, fatigue and bodily pain. So in the, in the model, it just talks about what are the social barriers to inclusion, like these physical outside barriers and these attitudinal barriers. But even in an ideal world where everybody was uh, accepting of people with a disability and every physical barrier had been taken away, people individually still have their own experience of impairment they have their own experience of pain and lived experience of um, maybe not being able to function at full you know capacity because they're fatigued or they're um, you know they have a physical disability which requires the uh, support of a support worker so one of the critiques of the social model is it doesn't bring in the um, experience of the lived body and, and the sort of De the deficits that are there in the lived body and the experience of disability sometimes. Um, and so this has to be has to be thought about. Also, the uh, social model is very much based on an oppression type framework, and not everyone with a disability views themselves these days as an oppressed person um, mm -hmm. by society and the, and the barriers in society. So um, that's sort of some of the critiques of the social model um, that are out there. So you know, in, in functioning in the real world, you know, you know, we have to work out how we can still be inclusive, um, but manage these bodily um, impacts on a day-to-day -day basis, such as fatigue and pain, um, and still function in the world. That's great. Thanks, Raylene. Uh, Ryan, and then Judy wants to say something quickly afterwards as well. So off you go, Ryan. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think in some ways, to me, the social model kind of presupposes uh, physical disability in a sense. Um, and I think, you know, it was written about for years and years and years and intellectual disability wasn't even really um, discussed or if it was, it was really largely implicit. Um, I think overall, you know, arguably too much has been said about the social model of disability and in much of my work, I kind of just abandoned um, that kind of paradigm and moved 
um, beyond it. Um, I suppose picking up on Ray's later comment about oppression, and I think this also links back with um, Ricky's question about um, special schools. And I think there's this kind of broader compulsion of um, once you identify disability, whatever that means, there seems to be this imperative to manage, to close down, to police in particular ways. And what I'm often interested in, in terms of disability, is what is actually productive and generative about disability. So uh, how Lizzie was talking about earlier, about just um, the way in which she can sit in a room and how she gets a different sense of her environment in different ways. So I'm kind of often looking for what's productive and generative um, from those kinds of spaces. So it's kind of, it's, it's an abandoning of, a, I suppose, an approach that kind of looks to kind of restrict and to kind of close down. Um, one other thing I would say before I hand over, because I, I do literally need to leave the house in like four minutes because I'm getting my second COVID jab, um, is the idea about um, one thing I really want to say in terms of why is sociology important and stuff, and this goes back to a couple of the other questions, um, is the importance of um, how particular disciplines own forms of knowledge. And so we know that, for example, medicine um, might say, and I'm probably homogenizing um, quite heterogeneous kind of positions, but I'll persist because I've only got a couple of minutes, but this kind of push to how medicine might say that the disabled body is a broken body that needs to be fixed. Um, how psychology might say that a disabled body, a uh, disabled mind is broken and need to be fixed. How economics might say that um, people with disability are drains on the system. Um, how construction management might say that they're a body that need to be dealt with in the design of their building so a disabled body can enter, exit and pass through a building. So all these kinds of different disciplines have their own particular approaches to disability that are problematic in many ways. And I think that just kind of really demonstrates the, the importance and the power of sociology and social sciences more generally. And that's not to say that there are, you know, pathologizing discourses and practices within sociology, but sociology provides a different way of looking at disability and looking at the world. And it's, to me, what's really important in disability is kind of conceiving disability as a lived experience, yes, but also as an analytical category. So if you throw disability into the picture, what does it look like? What does it change? How do we then perceive the world and navigate the world? I've spoken too much, so I'll leave it there. Yeah, I just uh, quickly want to add um, that from my point of view, um, what's happening with, um, with uh, neurodiversity definitely is that um, it's sort of been subsumed into our preoccupation with positive thinking. Um, I call it the rainbows and sunshine view of uh, of neurodiversity, it's part of you know our culture's kind of sinking, you know, like the Titanic, and we're just kind of admiring the paintwork or something. I just think it's really important to realise how much our society forces people and actually makes it really, really hard to say anything negative about any movement, any disability movement, in, and get it into perspective in a critical way. Great. So thank you all so much. We've actually come to 11.29. Um, if you could really stay online um, for the next couple of minutes. We do have um, the TARSA Critical Disability um, Group have all been developing a national student competition for years 10 to 12 um, to think about issues of disability justice that are occurring in our uh, younger people's lives at an everyday level. And what we'd like to do is just as part of our signing off for today is first thank you for all of your time. Thank our panellists, our wonderful Auslan interpreters, Sally Daly um, at Taza, who always does a wonderful job, and um, Lise Mogensen um, as co-convener of this group with myself. Um, 
just uh, here, just like to thank you all for coming along today. But also what we want to I want you to do is really, if you can, um, we encourage you to share um, with different young people that you might know of or school teachers or within your family and networks and so forth, this competition, because um, we really want young people um, to get involved um, because they really are the future of uh, transforming the world and disability justice is a, a core issue within that along with the environment and climate change social inequality um, yeah so I'm just going to do a screen share now and then after at the end of this this is when we'll sign out I'd like to thank all of our participants as well for joining us thanks for your wonderful questions um, and don't forget that this will also be online um, available on the TASA website this issues Want to find out how studying sociology can help change the world? Enter the Inclusion Is competition. Identify an issue on disability and justice, exclusion and discrimination. Then get creative. Write about it, create an artwork or a short film that shows how you think we could promote inclusion and participation of people with disability. Entries open August 9th, 2021. To find out more, visit the competition homepage on the Australian Sociological Association website. Great prizes to be won. Sorry, COVID roadmap at the end. No, no problem. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, and you've given us over an hour and a half. Really, really appreciate it. Um, and thanks to our wonderful panellists. Um, and, you know, if you're interested in sociological perspectives on disability, you, the Critical Disability Studies Group has multiple forms of membership through the TARSA, um, TARSA network, uh, students, uh, HDRs, and there's a whole heap of supports for uh, postdocs and early career researchers as well. So, you know, if, if you're really interested in this area, feel free to join us. We'd love to have more members involved. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Lizzie. Thank you, Ray. And thank you um, to all of our um, wonderful Auslan interpreters.